Baloo. Well, it's been too long since I've seen, I, I don't even know what it is. Is it Jungle Book? I need to, whatever it is, I need to watch it and, and find out all about who Baloo is and what he is. But hopefully if uh, it's a good thing, I won't disappoint. If it's not, I will uh, convince you otherwise. Okay, so I will uh, potentially be convincing you. Well, I don't know. We'll see if it is time to uh, abandon left uterine displacement. My plan is to give you all the information that you need, certainly, to uh, decide for yourselves whether it's time. Um, of course, I was going to say with uh, Bob, he just disappeared, but uh, of course the people who are here are going to say start on time, right? And I uh, appreciate the people who are here being here. I know it turned out to be a more beautiful day out there than uh, expected, and so I suspect that's part of what's making lunch go so long. And that is fine with me. I'm happy to lecture to whomever wants to hear it. I have no disclosures. And uh, right up front, I'll tell you that when I use the words displacement and uh, tilt, they mean the same thing. Uh, they're used interchangeably in the literature, and I will do so for this lecture as well. All right, so for the people who are here, I'd just like for you to give me a show of hands, please. Who currently, at the time of uh, spinal anesthesia for cesarean delivery, uh, incorporate left uterine displacement into your practice? And of course, everyone raises their hands. I, I guess I could also say who does not. Well, I will. Who, who does not routinely use left uterine displacement? So there are zero hands going up, and that is pretty much what I expected. All right, so uh, as you remember or know from yesterday, I, I kind of like starting with history lessons, and in this case, it's no different. Now, the first suggestion I could find of aortal caval compression comes from 1943. I just put a little random picture in there just to kind of give historical perspective of, of uh, how long ago that was. And this one was titled Antecubital and Femoral Venous Pressure in Normal and Toxemic Pregnancy. Uh, and and they, they went into details that I won't go into, but it's just, again, from the historical perspective, it's been that long since we talked about this. Now, uh, ten year, approximately 10 years previous, 1935, there was actually a study of uh, arterial contrast radiography in the, in the aorta and iliac arteries where they uh, demonstrated some filling defects that occurred, but it wasn't an extensive study and uh, didn't go much beyond that. By the time we made it to the 50s, the first report I can find of what we now call supine hypotensive syndrome, uh, this from 1953. And then in uh, the 60s, now my mother is not one of those people, but she, I could have been one of the babies in this uh, study based on the date. And this one looked at compression of the aorta uh, by the uterus in late human pregnancy, variations between femoral and brachial pressure with changes from hypertension to hypotension. So, what we're looking at here is upper extremity versus lower extremity arterial pressures with different uh, positions. And so by the 60s, 70s, this is sort of what we uh, had accepted as, as fact, is that, that we have this uh, phenomenon of uh, aortal cable compression causing supine hypotensive syndrome. So today, in 2017, if you put, if you Google aortal cable compression syndrome or supine hypotensive syndrome, they both uh, will take you to a Wikipedia page, which uh, is one of my favorite resources. If you snicker, if you will, but uh, you know it's it's uh, at least for for lay uh, information um, uh, and for for what is what's out there right now, it's usually pretty robust. And they say on Wikipedia that supine hypotensive syndrome is characterized by all of those symptoms that you can read there for yourself when a woman lies on her back and then resolves when she is turned to her side. So common, pretty much common thinking, common knowledge right now from uh, Wikipedia in 2017 that there is aortal cable compression due to the weight of the fetus and that is what is causing these signs of shock. So we have decided through all these decades since the 40s, 50s, 60s that the, it is in a woman's best interest to tilt the uterus in order to prevent all of these problems. The thing is we use this 15 degrees and uh, this editorial that I put up here, the, the title of you can see, Lateral Tilt for Pregnant Women, Why 15 Degrees? It's a very good read, but interestingly, doesn't even really answer the question, except to say that maybe there really isn't that much of an answer to this question. In the early 1970s, um, a researcher by the name of Crawford uh, 
uh, introduced what we now know as the, they call it the Crawford Wedge, some places we don't have one of those, but this 15 degree wedge, this author suggested that was completely arbitrary, it just happened to be 15 degrees. Others have suggested that there are OR tables, or at least there were, that would go no further than 15 degrees. I haven't investigated that by myself, but that's another theory, so. 15 degrees is rather arbitrary. I can tell you for sure, though, what I can tell you from uh, data that we have is that we are not good at estimating this tilt. Here's one study from 2003, 16 anesthetists, this is in uh, the UK. During caesarean sections, they were asked to tilt the table as per their routine, and then they were asked to say, okay, how, how much tilt is that that you've just given? The range of estimation was seven to look at that 35 degrees. And the actual, yeah, here laughs, it's, it, it is laughable, and you'll see, uh, 7 to 15 degrees. Only one patient was actually 15 degrees, and almost everyone overestimated tilt, and almost all of us do. So here is that, uh, those data graphically. So on the x-axis there, you can see the estimated degrees. On the y-axis, the actual degrees. So the red arrow now points through the ones that were estimated to be 15, and now pointing straight to the only uh, individual. Each dot is an individual estimate. And so there is one individual who both estimated 15 degrees and was at 15 degrees. But more importantly, if you look at all of those 15 degree estimates, almost all of them are between about seven and 11 or 12 degrees. And that is pretty typical of, of our practice. Now, of course, you can just put an inclinometer on the bed. And, and uh, I, in fact, I have an app on my phone. I didn't uh, get around to taking an actual picture of it in the operating room on the bed. But with this um, uh, commercially available photo of one that's used to estimate avalanche risk, you can see what I mean. You put this, imagine this on the head of the bed across the rigid rail that's you know, on, the, on the head. And then you can tilt it and see exactly how far you're tilting. I think if you do this, if you haven't done it already, you'll surprise yourselves at how little you actually tilt the bed during cesarean section. I can also tell you for sure that we do not like tilt. None of us do, the surgeons, the patients, nor do we. Now, the problem is I couldn't find a really good reference on this. I have some personal experience, and I'm sure all of you do as well. But there is, uh, almost uh, for your amusement, I put this in here, how it's this for a reference, is personal communication cited in an editorial. But it does say, volunteers express concern at a mean angle of nine degrees. And, and that is, we, we did a study, well, it was the pilot to a study we eventually did looking at cardiac output with different uh, angles of tilt. We were all asked to be volunteers for the same thing as that prior study I just showed you, and I, like everybody else, was underestimating the amount of tilt I had. We had a volunteer on the table, and they started to get anxious, even if they had a seat belt on at about, like this says, about 10 degrees, well before 15 degrees, people get anxious. And the surgeons don't like it either because it's more difficult for them to operate at that angle. Unlike the 15 degrees, I'll just throw this in here for your interest, there are uh, reasonably good data for the 27 degrees that is recommended in um, uh, resuscitation during pregnancy. And this goes way back to the 80s where uh, the recessa Annie mannequin was placed on a wedge and different uh, angles of tilt were used. So the 27 degrees was derived because that's about as far as you can go without the mannequin just rolling off. Uh, also, the ability to provide mouth-to-mouth -mouth diminishes the further past that you get. And perhaps most importantly, they put a forced transducer under the resuscitation mannequin and then the chest compressions. And your ability to provide compression starts to taper off once you get to that, that point. It, it, you're, you're less and less able to do it the more lateral you go from 27 degrees. So that's where the 27 degrees comes from. Perhaps more importantly though now, we're going to talk about the effective tilt. And what this really does for us. And I told you about some of the earlier studies, and a lot of that's in obstetric literature. Um, some of that is uh, anesthetic as well, but more of the later uh, literature that I'm going to show you is anesthesia literature. But uh, very little of the early stuff deals with spinal anesthesia and cesarean delivery, which is all we really care about. So I'm going to go through some of those studies from what I call the modern era. This is, I'm talking about the, the past 10 to 15, maybe 20 years at the most. This one from 2002, 60 uh, healthy elective cesarean deliveries where a spinal anesthetic was performed. They were randomized to two different positions. Half of them were uh, supine with what we now call our standard 15 degree tilt. 
and half of them in a full lateral tilt, and they maintain that position for 15 minutes. So spinal is placed, you either go into a 15 degree tilt or you go full lateral and wait 15 minutes. During that 15 minutes, they measured all of these uh, parameters. And I'm going to show you the results as we go from the top. Maternal heart rate, no difference at all. Maternal symptoms, no difference at all. Fetal heart rate, no difference. Ephedrine use, no difference. Upper extremity blood pressure, non-invasive blood pressure, no difference. Lower extremity, lower in the supine versus lateral position. So here again, uh, giving credence to this idea we've had for decades that lying supine compresses the aorta and decreases blood flow distal to that compression. Well, here are the data. Graphically, this is the upper extremity. Triangles are tilt, square is lateral, and you can see there's clearly no difference uh, at any time point in the 15 minutes after spinal. This is the lower extremity, where at four different time points, the difference reached to st statistical significance. So lower blood pressures when you're lying, um, or, and I'm sorry, not supine, but tilt, 15 degree tilt versus lateral. We call this aortic compression, or at least the authors did, and that's what we've come to accept after all of these years. Importantly, though, what we really care about, remember, look back again, I said all of those different, every physiologic parameter except leg blood pressure made no difference whatsoever, no fetal distress, no issues with maternal symptoms, blood pressure, anything at all. And then if you look at the neonatal uh, uh, condition at delivery, also no differences in acid-based um, uh, status in either group. And so this has no effect on the baby or the mother whatsoever. The following year, uh, 32 non-laboring non uh, third trimester women were uh, examined by bioimpedance cardiography. Their cardiac output was looked at in seven different positions. So first of all, completely supine, and then completely left or right lateral, and then two different angles, 12 and a half and five degrees in left and right position. So seven different positions. Here are their data graphically. I'm um, just showing a big version of it so that you can look at it uh, quickly to see how it's um, uh, organized, and then in a smaller version with results that hopefully you can see from where you are. All they found was that the left lateral position was significantly for different from just two positions, the two right tilts, and that is only a statistical significance, otherwise no difference. So in other words, basically you have to look pretty hard to find any difference at all with any of these uh, positions on, on cardiac output. In this case, the outcome being, variable being measured was cardiac output. And here are those cardiac outputs, and very importantly, if you look at all of them, they are all normal cardiac outputs. There's just a statistically significant difference in two positions. <clears throat> Another one several years later, 2011, 25 uh, healthy women presenting for elective cesarean delivery. Now we're back to a C-section study. Uh, Non-invasive cardiac output, in this case reported as cardiac index, was measured in four different positions, either sitting uh, with our standard 15 degree left tilt, right lateral or left lateral. And during the, this uh, study period, fetal heart rate and in this case, umbilical Doppler flow was actually measured. And the results here are pretty interesting, but really not that much uh, different than what we just saw in that sitting and supine, to me that's interesting that the sitting and supine were the same, but were uh, uh, less than the lateral, uh, two lateral positions. So if you look at right and left lateral, no difference at all, but there was a, a bigger diminishment in the lateral positions than sitting and supine. And these again are car cardiac ind indices, which are all put there. No difference at all in fetal heart rate, or, or no fetal heart rate abnormalities at all in any of the four positions. No differences in umbilical blood flow in any of the four positions. And the statistically significant differences they saw are all clinically insignificant. Those are the cardiac indexes that I've uh, outlined there, all normal. And one more, 2012, this is 157 non-laboring parturients. Uh, they were positioned in random order. The reason they did that is because there's some evidence that there is accommodation to position, different positionings for, from collateral circulation and changes in cardiac output and SVR and those sorts of things. So they were positioned in random order so that one position didn't affect the other. Those positions are supine, 7.5, 15, and 90 degree tilt, looking at non-invasive cardiac outputs and uh, non-invasive blood pressure in both lower, upper, and lower extremities. 
Importantly, every patient was asymptomatic throughout, even the supine ones. There was no difference in uh, systolic blood pressure or maternal heart rate. The only difference seen was in if you have any of the tilts that were less than 15 degrees, cardiac output decreased just a little bit. Importantly, though, very, very large variation in that difference. So the, the mean was 5%, but huge variation. Lots and lots of patients in this study had no changes whatsoever in any of the positions, yet 11 of them had a, a big change, 20% or greater when in the supine or the, the smaller tilts. Uh, it's important to note that this was, uh, like the two studies prior, was just in uh, term women, not in women having a spinal anesthetic for cesarean section, which is arguably by far the most important thing that we are concerned with. There are their data graphically. You can see very small changes in actual cardiac output, and all of those outputs are normal. This is an abstract that was published last year. I don't think it's being uh, submitted yet as a manuscript, but this comes from Columbia last year at SOAP. 89 elective cesarean deliveries were presented. They randomized to 15 degree tilt or supine and placed a spinal anesthetic, used the cheetah monitor for non-invasive cardiac output measurements and showed that at, at the baseline, there was no difference uh, in, in, with tilt in the cardiac output. And then after spinal, in the time between spinal and delivery, there was only a very small difference in uh, cardiac output. It was clinically insignificant, just like all of the other studies. All right, so that takes us to what I call the uh, granddaddy of them all, and the one that kind of gave, uh, that got, got me interested in this and kind of got me started on the whole thing. This is, it doesn't seem like two years ago, it seems like it was just published to me, but um, Higuchi from Japan, who's done a lot of other MRI studies in the, in the anesthesia literature you might be familiar with, with um, spinal anesthesia, things that are also very interesting. In this case, what he did was look at the effect of tilt and the supine position on the actual uh, vessels themselves using MRI. So he's got 10 parturients. He also did it with 10 uh, non-pregnant women, but uh, I'm going to focus on just the parturients. Looking at 10 uh, parturients with a uh, singleton full-term gestation, he measured at, uh, with an MRI at L1 and L2, or L1, L2, and L3, L4, the, both the aortic and IVC uh, areas. He's looking at supine and three different tilt positions, 15, 30, and 45 degrees. So what he found was that the aorta is not compressed at any angle, and the IVC, which is compressed at most angles, is not relieved by 15 degree tilt. It's only partially relieved at 30 degrees. And I'm going to show you uh, graphically here in just a minute to, to make that perfectly clear to you what that looks like. The bioimpedance card, uh, cardiac output measurements were the same in all groups, no matter what position they were in. All women were asymptomatic in every position, and here is uh, what that looks like. Now, I put them all together to, so you can see 0, 15, 30, 45 as it progresses, but I'm going to show them to you uh, individually so that you can see the image better from where you're sitting, hopefully. So there's supine. Where the uh, white arrow is, that is pointing to the aorta. You can see that it's perfectly round, and that is a gravid uterus. That's a baby laying on top of the aorta and vena cava without compressing the aorta in any way whatsoever. The vena cava, however, is completely obliterated. You cannot see it. There's no arrow on the vena cava because it's basically not present. At 15 degrees, now you have that open arrow on the left side. The vena cava just starts to show up. The uh, aorta is, again, uh, completely normal. Only at 30 degrees is there significant filling of the vena cava. Aorta, again, looks completely normal. And then again, at 45 degrees of, of filling of the vena cava in a normal aorta. So in the discussion, it was, I really, if you're interested in this at all, I really recommend this article in particular. It has a really good discussion and sort of reviews a lot of the literature up to this point. One of the things that Higuchi uh, um, uh, looks at in this is the 1966 study that I very briefly alluded to at the beginning in the history part. The uh, title again of it is Compression of the Aorta in Late Human Pregnancy, Variations Between uh, Femoral and Brachial Blood Pressure, so upper and lower extremity pressures from 1966. 
And what he says is that the authors uh, demonstrated an imaginary cross-section illustration of the abdominal cavity where the aorta and IVC were similarly remarkably compressed by the gravid uterus. We are all familiar with that image now, and I'm going to show a version of it here in just a minute, but I like the way he puts this. It's just uh, one of those things, again, how we just accept it as fact. You draw a picture where it looks really good and it matches what the data you showed up to that point uh, show, and it just makes sense and we stay with it forever. Uh, those illustrations were later modified and widely presented in many articles and textbooks. Again, we've all seen it, and here it is or at least one modern version of it. So there's the baby on the left side compressing both the aorta and the vena cava. That's why the brachial blood pressure or the uh, femoral uh, arterial pressure is low. That's why the baby gets distressed, supposedly. That's why the mother has symptoms. If you lay them on their side, then the aorta opens up again. I superimpose on that, though, the supine one of a picture of what actually happens and that is that the vena cava is indeed compressed, but that the aorta is uh, completely normal. So I don't know how to reconcile that. Uh, he doesn't either. And um, one, one thing I think might be, he, he touches on it but doesn't really discuss it, and that is common iliac artery compression. I, there, there's a potential for this being a um, you know, part of what we're seeing and why these lower extremity pressures are lower. Uh, he, I, all he goes on to say is that there's not enough resolution on the MRI to really say one way or another about this, but it might be a good uh, area for future research if it, if it matters to us. Again, I've, I've, I think, tried to convince you that clinically it really doesn't even make that much difference, except in a very small subset of patients. He did mention some of the limitations. This one kind of hurts a little bit being, uh, being from the southeast, or at least living in the southeast now, yes, and that is that these are Japanese women quite slender by the standards of many western countries. Ouch. Uh, now also importantly, this is not, again, we have told you three times now that what we really care about in all this is what happens when we place a spinal anesthetic, or, or an epidural arguably, but a regional anesthetic for cesarean section. This does not apply. It is uh, during, uh, just during pregnancy, during normal physiology, there is no sympathectomy that occurs with the spinal anesthetic. Abdominal relaxation, he mentions. I never even really thought about that, but that does kind of make sense that there might be something about the tension of the abdominal musculature that helps protect against these things. And the fact that we're not giving these women intravenous fluid boluses as we do with uh, spinal anesthesia. So in summary, uh, for sure, hypotensive, um, supine hypotensive syndrome is real. It happens to a very small subset of women. Uh, as far as obstetricians are concerned, the answer to that is, well, if you lay flat on your back and you don't feel good, then don't lay flat on your back. And that's all there is to that. And when it comes to labor and delivery, nurses, labor nurses will always change position no matter, as we all know, you've seen this, no matter what position they're in, if there are signs of fetal distress, the first thing they do is change positions. So I would argue there it's not even that important. When it comes to us, we're placing neuraxial anesthetics and making all these physiologic changes during a time when a patient is going to be lying down for their surgery, it's a completely different consideration. So there might be a small subset of women that we really don't know exactly what's going on with them, but that something truly is happening that we need to uh, treat or be prepared to treat. That inter-individual variation is very great. Now, it's also important to remember that if we are going to do this and tilt patients that 15 degrees tilt, there, there isn't much evidence to support that we're really doing anything with 15 degrees. If you really want to do something, you've got to pretty much put them on their side or at least 30 degrees. And even if you do or try to, it's difficult to estimate and achieve. Even if you put an inclinometer on the front of your bed, it's going to be hard to achieve that. You're going to have patients complaining, surgeons complaining, and so forth. Anything less than 15 degrees probably does nothing at all. Now, there are also some unknowns re that remain uh, more in line with our patient population, how much effect obesity has on this, and maybe it is important to tilt uh, obese patients more. Preeclampsia or any other physiologic derangements might uh, make, a, make a difference. Those things have not been uh, thoroughly studied or really studied at all in, in this context and uh, states such as uh, uteroplacental insufficiency. So my conclusion is, and my recommendation to all of you is that no, it is not time to completely abandon left uterine displacement. But I think you should also not uh, assume that it routinely helps. 
It should not be uh, something that is dogmatically held to, to at, at expense of everything else, such as patient comfort or, or the ability to do a surgery uh, quickly and, um, and efficiently. Remember, there might be a small subset of patients who are particularly susceptible, and remember that truly getting to 15 degrees is, is quite a lot. And that's all I have. Thank you.